Lover of my soul, I want to live for you. Um, man, that's awesome. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Boys and girls, you may go to children's church at this time, ages four years old through kindergarten. Um, and in case you're wondering, um, there is no outline, so no need to raise your hand. Um, no outline this morning, you can just kind of focus on the Word. We are, um, last week we finished up our series on the book of Psalms, and um, we did not cover all of them. In case you thought we were in the Psalms for a while, we simply did 15 of them, which is only 10%. So, um, if you think about that, so we could keep going in the Psalms. Um, actually, we'll come back to them at some other time. But I want to take the next four weeks or so to talk to you um, and preach through the, the chapter. We're not going to preach through the whole book, but the chapter of Matthew chapter 18. Jack Harris was a 79-year-old um, retiree from Somerset, England, who loved jigsaw puzzles. Anybody here love jigsaw puzzles? Hey, okay, more than I thought. And actually, he, he was actually pretty good at them. In fact, he was so good at them that he often boasted to his family when he got one for Christmas that it really wouldn't take him long to do them and he could finish them, uh, complete them so fast. So, because of his boasting, for Christmas 2002, partly as a joke because of his boasting, his daughter-in-law Eve bought him a 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle which depicted James Tissot's The Return of the Prodigal Son. Here she's thinking, let him finish this one quickly, right? Well, he began working on the puzzle with the intention of completing it by summer. However, it proved to be a little more challenging than that, a little more difficult than he anticipated. He struggled with the five-foot-wide puzzle, and the 5,000 pieces ended up taking up the majority of his dining room table for more than seven years <laughs> as he strived to complete it. His daughter-in-law said this. She said, it was so massive. We'd all have, have a go at it each time we went over there, but it just seemed to take forever. So after seven years of working on this ginormous puzzle, as you see there, um, when he finally began putting the final pieces in place, seven years later, he was dismayed when he got to the end and found that there was one piece missing. Yes, that's right. Seven years of work. He was so disappointed. He was so dismayed. Where was that piece? He said they looked for it. They couldn't find it. They didn't know if it was missing from the manufacturer. But his family figured that maybe it was thrown away by mistake or one of his son's two dogs might have eaten it. <laughs> Nobody knew. All they knew was it was missing. Now, lest you think there's a sad ending to that story, there's actually a happy ending. Because when the puzzle manufacturer, Jumbo Games, found out about uh, how hard that he had worked on this uh, puzzle and so forth, and how hard, um, how, how much de uh, dedication he'd had towards it, uh, at first when they, kinda, they said, well, there's nothing we can do about it, because the puzzle was out of print. <laughs> but they actually found the original design and had their expert puzzle designers make the missing piece just so he could complete the puzzle. Good job for them, right? Good job for them. Friends, here's why I tell you that story. It's because as we look around the American church today, um, I believe there are some things missing. I believe, like that missing puzzle piece, there are many, many qualities and attributes and character traits that, that ought, to be, ought to be there, ought to be visible in the, in the church today, but unfortunately, sadly, they're woefully missing. Many churches and believers today have embraced a type of Christianity that fails to teach and preach and even lift up certain character traits and qualities that I believe embody Christ-likeness itself. And therefore ought to be apparent in the church today, however, as a whole, they are not. And so over the next four weeks, in an attempt to change that, because 
Listen, if, let's be honest. If we're going to change the church, it has to start where? Right here. It has to start here. If we're going to change the church, it starts here, friends. But, so over the next four weeks, we're going to talk about, um, through, as we work through the t- Matthew 18, four qualities that Jesus, I believe, describes here in Matthew 18 uh, that we need to emulate, that, that are absolutely needed in the church today that I believe as a whole are often missing. Today we're going to start with the first one, and I'm going to go and tell you what it is. It is simply humility of heart. Unfortunately, there are many gospels, if you will, preached in our world today that promote things other than humility. Self-fulfillment, self-importance, even personal success is promoted in many circles, even in Christian circles, above humility of heart. In today's world, both Christian and secular, we're told that if we want to be successful, if we, if we want, to, want to make something of ourselves, then we have to promote ourselves, that we have to be confident, we have to be self-assured, we have to know what we want so we can go out there and get it and be successful. We have to force our way to the top. Even in the church, I believe often we see this certain, look how God has blessed me mindset. In fact, I know um, on, uh, there's a hashtag blessed. You ask, a lot of times people ask how we're doing. We say, well, I'm blessed. As if not being blessed is somehow not being favored by God. It, it's prevalent in the church today, friends. Now, when we hear that, what do we think? First thing we think is prosperity gospel preachers. And that prosperity gospel. And listen, that's definitely where a lot of this comes from. But I believe this mindset can be just as prevalent in conservative evangelical circles as well. It's maybe not just stated out in the open. For example, look how many, uh, how many successful megachurch pastors are viewed. They write a book, maybe have their, their sermon series all made into Bible studies, and nothing wrong with that in and of itself. Many times the worship pastor or worship teams have a CD made or have their music published and so forth. And, and while most of those things, there's nothing wrong with them and they're done out of a pure heart, oftentimes, intentional or not, these pastors and worship leaders are looked at more like celebrities than they are men of God. Their success is valued more than their character. Friends, and all I'm saying in the, is this. This kind of thinking is contrary to the heart of the gospel. As we begin chapter 18... Jesus begins with a simple analogy that I believe combats this kind of thinking. Look at verse 1 with me, if you will, Matthew 18. It says, At that time, connecting it to the previous chapter, many, um, many commentators believe that uh, they were actually at Peter's home. We don't know that for sure. Speculation, but nevertheless, the, it appears that they're in Someone's home, if you read the context of these. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It's a question that the disciples had been arguing about among themselves. We learned from both the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke that that this question most likely resulted from an an ongoing argument that the twelve had had uh, among themselves. Who's greatest? Who's greatest? Who's going to sit at his right hand? And there are other instances throughout Scripture that that these uh, questions come up. If you'll remember just a couple of chapters earlier, it was Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ that Jesus said would be the foundation of the church. Listen, all throughout history, Peter has been lifted up to some uh, uh, higher standard than even uh, even Scripture does. The disciples... Probably got that a little messed up as well. Uh, in chapter 17, Peter, along with James and John, had gotten to witness Jesus' transfiguration. So you can imagine how the others might have felt. What you got to see? What? There, uh, as, as jealousy starts to creep in and spur arguments between them, as it does so often with all of us in our human mindset. And so here they are for whatever reasons, arguing who, who, who's greatest, who, 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 who's, 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 who does Jesus favor more? And so the question comes, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? How does, how does Jesus answer this one? We'll look at, if you look at verse 2, we see that he answers it with a, an analogy, a, a, a live illustration, if you will. Look at what he says. 
Verse 2 says this. It says, Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said. So here Jesus is talking among them. The question arises, um, who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And instead of just coming out and saying, Jesus uses an illustration. He calls a little child. Now the, the word for child here is, is, is pideon. It's a, it's a word that means, uh, oftentimes it's used for infants uh, and so forth, but little child, a child who is not really capable yet of, of, of helping themselves. It appears here that it was maybe a toddler because evidently Jesus called the little child and the, the little boy was able to come to him. He set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children. Here's his illustration. Here's this little child sitting among them. Unless you become like this little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Friends, in answering this question, Jesus here is getting at the essence of really what it even means to be a Christian. Okay, When we come to Christ uh, for salvation, we don't come with all of our accolades. You know, many times when I'm talking to somebody about uh, putting their faith in Christ and trusting in Christ, um, there is, they answer in something like this, Well, Pastor, I would like to, but first... I need to do this. Or, or first, pa yeah, Pastor, well, when I get this together, then I... Listen, friends, we don't come to Christ for salvation with any accolades. We don't come with, with some list of, of, of stuff that we've done. That, that's not what, what, what makes us valuable in God's eyes. What makes us valuable in God's eyes is simply that we come to Him. <laughs> that we are His, that He has created us. Here Jesus is speaking of a necessity that must take place in order for us to become, even be become a Christian, to enter into the kingdom of God. And he says, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The word converted here is the Greek word strepho. And it, it's a, it, it simply means to turn, to turn around, to, to, to turn from oneself. So, um, the word is translated in the New King James here, unless you are converted. I believe in some translations it's translated turn. So unless you, you are turned, unless you turn and become like little children. Um, this language of turning and becoming like little children it, he's, it is not something that is, he's just talking about something on the outside. Um, the language speaks to the change in attitude of heart that Jesus is calling us to. It's it's not just an outer change, but it's, a, it's an inner change. It's not, it's not an intellectual thing whereby we simply assent to certain beliefs. It's not an identification thing where we simply call ourselves such or we now identify as a Christian. It's not an, an action where we must do certain things, friends. It's an inner change that must take place in response to what God has done for us. It's not a new paint job, you know. I've driven cars around that needed a new paint job, right? Um, sometimes we may look at ourselves in the mirror and we think, I need a new paint job, <laughs> right? It, it's not a new paint. It's not an exterior thing. It's not, it's not that we just need to have some body work done, you know, fixing up the outside while, while no, that's not it, friends. It's not, it's not that we just need some new tires. It is the fact that we need our engine replaced. We need, we need the change uh, that needs to take place is on the inside of us. And God, we need to allow God to change our heart. It's, it's a spiritual change that must take place. Because naturally, out of the womb, we all have a problem. Who's on the throne of your heart naturally? We are, right? We're on the throne of our heart. We like to do what we want to do. And, and we're naturally... Uh, averse to allowing anyone or anything else to be the boss of our lives. Our hearts are, are naturally hard. They're naturally rebellious. They're naturally self-centered. That's why, you know, uh, when you hear the, 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 the term survival of the fittest, uh, there's actually some truth to that concept because, listen, we all naturally work towards self-preservation. We all naturally are just simply trying to survive in this old evil world. The problem is, that that attitude also makes us arrogant and prideful 
and self-absorbed at times. And let's be honest, sometimes difficult to get along with. Amen? Friends, that's why Jesus says here that in order to be a part of his kingdom, in order to enter the kingdom, we must be willing to turn from that, to turn from that that self-centered, self-righteous, us on the throne of our lives attitude, and we must need to be willing to allow him to be on the throne of our lives. We need to humble ourselves. We need to be willing to become like a little child. The question is, what does that mean? What does it mean to become like a little child? We need to be childish. We need to be childish in our... Th- no, that's not what it's talking about at all. Look at verse 4. In case we don't get the analogy, Jesus takes it one more step here in verse 4. He says, There ever... Therefore, excuse me, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's not the one who climbs to the top. It's not the one who does great things in the name of the Lord. It's not the one who thinks they are something or gets a book. Any of that kind of stuff, that's not it, friends. Uh, the word humble simply means to make low. It, is, it means that we don't put ourselves First, it means we have a heart like Jesus had. Amen. Philippians chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the very form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant going to the cross and sacrificing himself on the cross for us. Friends, Jesus, being, being God, did not consider the, his godhood something that he couldn't set aside for a while. But he was willing to humble himself. Think about that. As part of the Godhead, he was willing to come and think about how he was treated. Just in his normal everyday, not, not even when he got to the cross, but just... And here... We are called to do the same. We are called to to have an attitude that is not too high of ourselves. We are called to have an attitude that that, that, we're not trying to prove something. We're called to have an attitude where we're not trying to promote ourselves or not trying to work up confidence in ourselves, friends. But I think being humble is being willing to admit our own inadequacies, being willing to admit our need for God. If you think about what's the biggest characteristic of a little child of what Jesus is bringing out here, I believe it's the fact of simply that a small child, a little child, an infant, as several of you have recently had new babies, a toddler, um, listen, when they get to be teenagers, they think they can do everything, right? We all did, okay? Let's be honest. But when kids are little, they, um, there's a dependence on their parents. Most kids know that, right? Most kids, well, they know that, you know, until a certain age, they, they know that and so forth. I remember when our kids were little, they probably don't even remember this. Um, when they were real little, I would joke around with them sometimes. And I would say such things as, um, if we were on a trip or something, I'd say, hey, um, how about, as we go back, how about you drive and I'll take the nap? Now, this is when they were real little. Oh, Dad, we're just kids. You know, or, or, you know, I, listen, Laura hated this. I saw she went to helping children's church today. But Laura, Laura hated this um, when I would do this because I, she never knew if I was serious or not. But the kids would be at home and start say, you know what, we need to go out on a date. And they're just little, you know, maybe six, seven, five, whatever, all that age and so forth. And um, I, I, I would say to her, I'd say, listen, and, and then I'd say to them, I'd say, listen, we're going to go out for a little while. Y'all take care of yourselves. <laughs> she didn't like when I joked around like that because I'm not sure she was, thought I was joking. Um, <laughs> maybe I wasn't, I don't know. Um, But they would say, Dad, Dad, we're kids. What is it about a little kid? It's the fact that they trust their parents. They rely on their parents. They need their parents to provide for them. 
They can't take care of themselves out in this big old world by themselves. And friends, I believe it's that quality is at the heart of what Jesus is getting at. What, how are we supposed to become like children, friends? We need to humble ourselves and be willing to submit ourselves to depend completely, wholly, 100% on the Lord. 100%. What's the problem? The problem is that our pride raises up in us. We think we don't need anybody. We don't think we need God. And our heart gets hard. Even as Christians, sometimes we think, hmm, if all Christians could just be like me, we'd have a lot better country, wouldn't we? You know, I'm finally getting to a place in my Christian life where where I feel like I'm having some victory. You know, when Paul talks about um, the fact, uh, his thorn in the flesh, and, you know, he, he tells us that he, he prayed for God to take it away. And, and, and here's the thing. Paul never names it. He, we don't know what his thorn in the flesh was. It was something that, 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 that was afflicting him. Many people believe it was a physical problem. Some people believe it was a mental thing. Um, uh, listen, I'm not so sure it just wasn't some sin that he was continuing to struggle with. As he prayed and asked God to take that away, here's what God said. God didn't, if you know, look at that, God didn't say he would or he wouldn't, but here's what God said. My grace is sufficient for you. Friends, that's what we need to, where we need to come to. When Jesus here says, listen, unless you are converted, unless you turn, unless you stop being so stubborn and prideful and think you got all the answers and you're willing to submit to yourself and humble yourself. And, and you know, the, the posture of humility really is, is that posture of on our knees, submitting ourselves to God. Here's the problem. Too often we just have a hard heart. We have a hard heart. You know, if you ever go over to the sink, grab the sponge to wipe off the countertop. If you just grab the sponge and start wiping, it's not going to work too well. Why not? Because the sponge is hard. It's hard because it's, it's sat there and it's been out of the water and it's dried out and it's gotten hard and crusty. And in order for the sponge to become useful again, what do you have to do? Simply put it in water. And it's good for wiping anything down. Friends, in a similar type fashion, just as the water softens the sponge, we need to allow God to soften our hearts. Maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ. You've been fighting Him. You've been struggling. You've been questioning. i gotta, I got to know all the answers. i gotta, I got to figure all this out. Friends, let me tell you, um, I believe Scripture gives us more than enough evidence and more than enough proof to know that Jesus was who He said He was and He did what He said He did. But there's a point at which we simply need to trust. Either we're going to believe it or we're not. Either we're going to allow God to work in our hearts and soften our hard heart and we're going to humble ourselves before Him and we're going to submit to Him. Listen, because remember what I said, becoming a Christian is not just about ascending to some intellectual beliefs, but it's about surrendering our heart to the Lordship of Christ in our lives. But friends, also, maybe you've trusted Christ and you're walking with Him and there's areas of your life where He's saying, listen, you really need to surrender this to me. You need to submit this to me. He's putting his finger on our lives, friends, as God prods and his Holy Spirit points out things in our lives. How should we respond? We need to respond with, yes, Lord, I submit. Yes, Lord, I surrender. Unless you are converted, you turn and become like a little child will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And by no means will we be great in God's eyes. 
Friends, greatness comes through submission and surrender to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done for us. Giving of yourself as the payment for our sin on the cross. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we all come with some hardness of heart. I think sometimes we'd even like to be prideful and say, no, that's not me, Pastor. If we're honest, there are are areas in each one of our lives where we have refused to submit to your reign. Lord, the very way we come to salvation is by humbling ourselves before you, turning and trusting you as our Savior. Lord, today, we surrender. We surrender to what you want to do in our lives. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Soften the hardness of heart that we often have. Make our hearts and lives pliable to you, Lord. Do your work in us today. Friend, if you're here this morning 